Okay, well, uh, it just happens the next speaker or the next project also involves heating and cooling, right? So, uh, EJ, uh, Ernest Angaro, he likes to be called EJ. So he's really in a unique situation. You see most students, you know, 99% of students who come to SSU, they work hard, or at least they think they work hard to <laughs> pass all the exams and tests, right? To get a degree and then they get a job. But this guy, while he's pursuing his college degree, he already has a job. He actually manages a company, um, uh, you know, along with his family members and doing something in HVAC. Mm -hmm. So last fall, he came to my office. He said, I really want to work on something involving uh, this solid state refrigeration. And I said, why? He said, no, I just, I'm just interested in this. So I said, how much do you really know? Well, I know little, but I can, you know, really work on this. You know, give me like, you know, a month or two, I can come up with a plan to really, you know, do whatever uh, I have to do to get the project going. And then I made a big assumption, you know, because this guy does H, uh, Mac. So he should have a lot of, you know, hands-on uh, experiences, right? I let him just do this thing. As it turns out, yeah, he's such a hard worker. And uh, now after like you know, nine months, when I look back, I really feel like, you know, he already has a job, right? <laughs> so, but he still works so hard in the lab. He comes to my office almost like every week, just, you know, tell me what works, what doesn't. Uh, and now when I look back, I really feel like my, I, my assumption was so correct because he really owns this project. All right, so let's give a warm welcome to uh, EJ. Right. Um, thank you for the introduction, uh, Dr. Shi. Uh, my name is uh, Ernest Ongaro, and my capstone is solid state refrigeration technology with thermoelectric coolers, uh, TEC for short. So first off, uh, what is a TEC? Functionally, it is a heat pump which regulates the temperature of a system. Specifically with the TEC, it utilizes the Peltier effect which is a well-known phenomenon discovered in 1834 where thermal energy is transferred across two dissimilar conductors. Being a solid state technology, those two dissimilar conductors are in the form of a semiconductor PN junction. This is a diagram of such a, a PN junction in a TEC module. And uh, as an electric current flows through the module, the uh, thermal energy is transferred from the cold side to the hot side. And if you were to reverse the direction of the electric current, the direction of the thermal energy would also reverse. So why do we care? Uh, first off, they're small. That is a picture of an actual commercially available uh, TC in my hand. And because of that, they could be used in places that conventional refrigeration technology simply wouldn't fit. Um, also, they're very reliable. It's not a mechanical system. There's no moving parts that need to be replaced or maintained uh, year after year. Because of that, they're already being utilized in the medical industry to regulate the temperature of uh, medication and organ donations. And uh, finally, there's no uh, fluids involved. In uh, conventional refrigeration technology, there's actually a gas that's compressed at a very high pressure held uh, within the system. And if that gas were to escape, it's actually a terrible greenhouse gas. There's uh, no such uh, fluids involved in the solid state technology. So uh, being a heat pump, one of the most important properties to consider is the cooling capacity. And this is simply how much thermal energy is either uh, being put into or taken out of the system by the TEC. Specifically with my experiment, that system that the TEC is working on is a test mass, a piece of metal with a known specific heat capacity. What this means is we know exactly how much uh, energy it takes to uh, change one gram of that material one degree. So, we uh, measure the temperature of that material as the TC is working on it. And with uh, that information, we could then calculate the uh, cooling capacity. 
Another very important uh, property con to, uh, to consider is the coefficient of performance. And this is basically what is the benefit that the TC is giving us, which is the thermal energy that's being taken out of the system, divided by the work that it took to do that. In this case, it's an electrical device, so as we're tracking the temperature decreasing in the material, we're also tracking the current and the voltage that the TC is using. And with those properties, we could then calculate the work, which gives us the COP, the thermal energy, divided by uh, the work that it took to move it. So this is a broad view of my laboratory setup. On the left and the right, you see the computers that were gathering the data. And in the center is my test apparatus. That is a close-up view of the top of the test apparatus. And uh, that is the TC module right there, the white square. So the general purpose of my test apparatus is to create an ideal operating environment for the TC. This comes in the form of two main components, one that's dealing with the cold side of the TC and one that's dealing with the hot side of the TC. So uh, first off, the vacuum chamber, which is dealing with the cold side of the TC. Its job is to completely thermally isolate the uh, test mass from the outside environment, not letting any thermal energy penetrate and get to the test mass, and any thermal energy that is existing within the test mass, only allowing it to escape through the TEC itself. So here's some details of my uh, vacuum chamber. You can see the various sensors that were used to uh, gather the parameters needed for the calculation, as well as this clear tube on the left here, which is tracking the pressure inside the vacuum chamber, making sure that it's as close to a perfect vacuum uh, as possible. So the other half of my apparatus is the water cooling system. This is dealing with the hot side of the TEC. And its job is almost the opposite of the vacuum chamber. It's taking that thermal energy from the test mass and dissipating it into the environment as efficiently as possible. And it uh, does this with an aluminum heat exchanger. And the thermal energy is transferred from that heat exchanger into the water and then dissipated through the radiator. Here's some uh, details of the water cooling system. You can see the fan and the radiator that were used to dissipate that thermal energy. And then this picture is the two sides of the apparatus coming together. You can see the reservoir with the tubes of water going to the top of the vacuum chamber where that aluminum heat exchanger is affixed directly to the top of the TEC. So while the experiment is going on, we're tracking all sorts of uh, parameters for our calculations. We're tracking the temperature of the cold and hot side of the TEC, the pressure inside the vacuum chamber. Uh, the voltage stayed uh, at a constant value of four volts, and then uh, the current. So this is an example of some of the data. This is a current over time. And you can see that the current starts at a certain value and then decays very, very quickly to a relatively constant value. And that constant value depended on whether the TC was actually working on a thermal load and what that thermal load was. Um, this is temperature over time. And that black line is the TEC without any test uh, mass uh, being worked on. And you can see that it reaches that constant temperature very quickly. The red line is copper, which takes a little bit more time. And then finally, that blue line is aluminum, which takes much, much longer to reach that uh, constant temperature. And that makes sense because aluminum has roughly three times as high of a specific heat capacity as copper does. So um, this is uh, the results that I got. And just to remind everybody, what I'm looking for is the cooling capacity, which is how much uh, thermal energy is being transferred per unit time, as well as the COP, so how much thermal energy uh, per work, uh, electricity in this case. 
So I have three different data sets here. They all started at the same initial temperature and they represent three different temperature drops which yielded three different sets of values for the cooling capacity and the COP. So you can see that as the temperature drop increases, the cooling capacity and the COP actually uh, decrease. And this makes sense because as you can see, these three lines are not decreasing at a constant value. They're flattening out over time. But what's very important to note here is that even though that these values change depending on the temperature drop, the types of metal that we're testing, which have different specific heat capacities, does not yield a different value for the cooling capacity and the COP. And to uh, further uh, test this independence for the specific heat capacity, I got the data sets from the copper with the calculated COP and then took the data from uh, the aluminum and using that COP value from copper, I, I saw that if I could calculate the specific heat capacity of aluminum from that. And this again represents the three different temperature drops. And as you can see, the three values that I ended up getting are very close to each other. And not only are they very close to each other, but it's only a two to six percent difference from the actual known specific heat capacity of aluminum, which is a 0.9. And that actually was a far better number than, than I anticipated. So that was, uh, that was fantastic. So um, future work, this, this type of uh, test apparatus could be perfected um, with further work to, uh, to get an even more accurate a calculation of the specific heat capacity and might even have the ability to identify certain materials by calculating that specific heat capacity. Um, in addition to that, you could then test an alloy such as bronze, which is made up of copper and tin, and then find out what the specific heat capacity is, and then you might even be able to figure out the exact makeup of the, the tin and the copper, what percentages uh, that make up the alloy. And then uh, lastly, I think that this experiment could uh, be adopted by an intermediate level physics lab because it's relatively um, inex uh, inexpensive to put together. The way in which you conduct the experiment is also pretty straightforward, yet with that simplicity it yields some very interesting numbers and teaches a lot about not only uh, thermal dynamics but uh, solid state uh, refrigeration technology, of course. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Question, questions for Ernest? Uh, was there a reason you chose to use those two materials for your testing, or was that just kind of in the lab? Well, uh, for one, I wanted obviously something that wasn't an alloy, so I knew what its specific heat capacity was. And actually, because of the, the industry that I work in, copper w is very easy for me to source just from uh, metal that would have been recycled anyways. And then as far as the aluminum, I wanted to find something that had a pretty different specific heat capacity in order to see a difference. And since it has three times as high as copper, that made it a really good choice. Uh, so do you, do you, you just used a mechanical pump in this, correct? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Was that sufficient? Or if, if you had more research sources, would you improve the vacuum? And how would you think that would change? You know, the vacuum was actually, I mean, it took a lot of work to, to get it there, but the pump itself actually pumped it down really, I mean, to the point where uh, that one slide didn't actually represent it, but it went low enough where it couldn't even, uh, the data acquisition software couldn't even detect wow. a value. So, Definitely. yeah, I mean, I, what I, I actually used a, com a commercial quality HVAC pump okay. uh, the, with the highest volume capacity that I could buy, actually. So, okay. 
Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> no arguments there. <laughs> all right, let's thank you, Jake.